Welcome to our training on the Historic Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, the first bipartisan climate bill introduced into Congress this decade. Our webinar series, Citizens Climate University, is a weekly program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and tonight's topic is specifically focused on conservative outreach, updates and suggestions from our very own conservative director, Jim Tolbert. So let me introduce you to Jim, and then I'll pass the baton to him. Jim Tolbert is CCL's conservative outreach director, and in that role, Jim engages, recruits, retains, and activates conservatives within CCL. Doing so, he builds on 20 years of experience on the board of the Michigan Chemistry Council, his training as a geochemist, and a career helping Fortune 500 companies characterize and clean up contamination from historic spills of PCBs, chlorinated dioxide, and other pollutants. At this point, our agenda tonight is really straightforward. Thank you so much for joining us, Jim. We're going to have a chance for Jim to highlight Jonathan Haidt's research and then look at our five key messages from a conservative outreach train. We'll then walk through conservative statements of support as well as Jim's advice in responding to criticism. He'll have some advice on how to help with local outreach and then we'll get into a Q&A discussion. Thank you all for being here. The floor is yours, Jim. Great. Thanks, Brett. And I, I did want just one other ground rule. So when I'm speaking tonight, I might often speak of your member of Congress or talking to a friend, and I'm really focused on those conversations you have with Republican members of Congress or conservative friends. So the word may not slip in there, but um, yeah, just keeping in, in context that this is about conservative messaging. To, to kick this off, I'm gonna do a, a, a much condensed review of Jonathan Haidt's work, um, this kind of times with the core volunteer training for, for conservative outreach. And um, so next slide, Jonathan Haidt is a researcher who looks at um, how people evaluate what is acceptable for them to do. So he's got a got work that he calls his moral, the moral foundations theory, um, which is really just ideas that underlie how we evaluate what's acceptable for us to do. Um, he looks across culture, he looks um, uh, within the United States, um, next slide, and he has identified um, five key aspects with a, with a sixth one we don't, we don't talk about as often of, of dimensions or we might call them values of how we, evaluate, how we consider what's appropriate for us to do. Um, and, I, and I hope many of you heard these before. We're going to go through them rather quickly today. Harm and harm and care. We just, when we're figuring out what's acceptable for us to do, we figure out if it hurts somebody. Um, when we, the second one is fairness. Um, when we figure out what's what's uh, acceptable to do, we figure out if we figure out if we think it's fair. And already you can see a little bit of conflict. Um, each of these values can have conflict. I might say it's not okay to uh, lock somebody up. I think that's harming them. Uh, I don't think you can just go lock somebody in the house next door and say you can't leave. Um, however, if you go and break the law and drive drunk too many times or steal or, or bring a gun and rob a bank, I think it's perfectly right for the state to go and lock you up. So there's a fairness thing that everybody agrees with that, that, that these morals often, often uh, bump up against each other and have to be weighed against each other. Moving down, loyalty, betrayal versus uh, how we treat people in our groups and how loyal we are versus getting a sense of betrayal is another thing that people consider when they're evaluating what's appropriate for them to do. Authority, uh, paying respect to authority and authority versus subversion is the other side of that. Um, purity and sanctity versus degradation, things that we consider pure or sacred, um, we expect to treat differently and oftentimes we can trigger senses of disgust um, if we violate people's senses of pure, pureness and sacredness. And the last one we won't talk, we don't talk about as much as liberty and oppression uh, that, that Haidt has, has written on. So the reason that we're really interested in these is that Jonathan Haidt um, has pulled out how these values differ between people that call themselves more conservative and more liberal. So on this graph, along the bottom axis, we have um, people, whether they consider themselves more strongly liberal on the left, more strongly conservative on the right. 
And on the left axis, the up and down axis, we have how relevant is an idea for when they're evaluating what's acceptable for them to do. On the top, people strongly agree that an idea is relevant. At the bottom, people strongly disagree that that idea is not relevant and the solid line in the middle is pretty neutral. Um, so what Jonathan Haidt has found is people that are, are self-identifies or identify through survey as uh, more uh, liberal, typically use, consider harm and care, does it hurt someone, and is it fair as their dominant moral compass, the things that they consider most relevant when they're considering what's acceptable to do. Um, and if we click once, uh, as we look over towards conservatives, conservatives bring in three of the three other dimensions and harm and care become less important, but still important. But conservatives are much more likely to consider in-group loyalty, authority, and purity and sanctity in their, in the way that they consider, the way that they evaluate what's acceptable behavior. And this plays out in how we can communicate with them. Um, it is important to communicate ideas that where you are asking people to act or asking people to care in, in, uh, in, in patterns that reflect their moral values, not your own. If, if in communicating with other people, you are only willing to reflect your own moral values onto them and assume they share them with you, you will be less effective at communicating than if you can figure out other people's moral values and frame things in a, in a dimension that relates to their own moral values. So I'm gonna walk through each of these, each of these uh, dimensions that uh, conservatives are more likely to engage on, in-group loyalty, authority, and purity. So first one is loyalty and betrayal. Um, condensed version here, a, a couple of, of good examples. Uh, on the left, um, just uh, who you quote, what you associate yourself with. We all associate ourselves with groups. Um, and it, it, we often wear these associations more visibly than we think. Um, so if you walk into a presentation and you think there are conservatives in the audience and you brought your climate reality deck, recognize that you're walking into a presentation and saying, I really support the former Democratic uh, vice presidential uh, or presidential nominee that was the former Democratic vice president. And no disrespect for Al Gore or for the group he's put together, but if you're speaking to a group of conservatives, um, I really advise people to, to pay attention to those kind of subtle cues um, that, that are out there by doing things like having climate reality slides in your deck. It's very similar to if somebody walk, if I were to go to speak to a, uh, the Democratic Buncombe County group, uh, local group, and I wore my mega hat in, um, that might not be the best, uh, best messaging to be sending. Um, there are, are a number of ways around this also that, that, that play, play into our, into our uh, examples and the way we communicate on climate change. Um, so when we're talking about climate change, we often speak about why are we concerned and who's being impacted. And when we can drive it down to local groups and local impact, local jobs, local, local events, um, we speak, we are more likely to speak to groups uh, that conservatives are more engaged with, are more loyal to, than when we speak with groups that are outside of our group. So flooding in Bangladesh is important and is, is uh, critical for us to solve, but does not uh, reflect local in-group loyalty as well as speaking about flooding in your hometown, whether that's Houston, Texas, Fayetteville, North Carolina, um, fires in if you live out in, in uh, Idaho, you know, the smoke blowing in. Um, finding those ways to create a local issue that you're raising as your examples and moving away from more abstract uh, outside of group uh, issues. So, so uh, authority subversion is another example where uh, uh, respect for authority um, is something that plays uh, much stronger on, uh, on the conservative side. And um, often progressive people, uh, people more on the progressive side tend to think it's, it's not a relevant dimension. And it's just important to recognize some of the messaging that can come across in our, in our communications on climate change. The two pictures here, um, like they I, I like these two pictures because they do kind of both have a certain emotional um, oomph to them. The top one is, our National Guards, our guardsmen at the border of Mexico. And the bottom one is the current uh, 
uh, protests in France that are occurring um, over a gas tax that's related to climate change. Um, and these can all these types of images uh, get played in, into by both uh, people supporting our policy as well as people opposing our policy. Um, I've seen a number of, of articles from people opposing our policy lately um, pointing out that there are riots in France over uh, what they would call a carbon tax. Um, and recognizing uh, how these, this imagery plays in, um, it's important to hear the message um, through the value structure that the, of the person you're speaking to. And so some, some, uh, some ideas on this for, for specific, a little bit more concrete as we're talking about uh, discussing the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividends Act is find support statements that you can use in quotes from conservatives. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll have a couple of those later, but there are, these will be in the, the, uh, the slides that you can download. The Brett will show you where they are at the end. We have a suite of conservative quotes in a spreadsheet that you can go pick from if you're looking for conservative quotes to put into talks um, that include a whole bunch from George H.W. Bush, because I just added um, probably 40 good quotes from him, um, as well as a, a broad range of, of, uh, of quotes. Um, show support, show that you support free markets and capitalism in your talk. Um, I, when I'm talking to audiences that contain some conservatives, I always take time to make it a point to stress that, that, that I value the, fr the free markets and that I even value the, the fossil fuels that we get to use in our free market, you know, that, that uh, allow us to have this webinar, that, that allow me to be here in a heated building. I just had a nice warm dinner, um, watch PBS NewsHour, I have lights on in my room, and I'm connected to people across the country here all because of fossil fuel. None of this would be possible without fossil fuel. Um, and, that, and, and I'll often present, I'm not really, I'm not at all opposed to the using of the fossil fuel. What I'm opposed to are the secondary consequences of it that we get from CO2 emissions. And just start from a position where you're not saying, I think free markets and capitalism are the problems. And even take time to recognize you may need to start from a position where you're convincing the people in the room, if they're conservatives, that you don't think free markets and capitalism are the problem. And, um, and so Stephanie was on before this, and I, I, I have no idea. Actually, I didn't hear the whole talk. But as we start getting into environmental justice arguments, those often don't play as well. On the right, that's, which is the right is often more concerned with free choice um, than, than, um, than some of the environmental justice arguments. And, and those uh, um, are hard to mix sometimes. Next, next dimension is, is purity and sanctity of things we consider pure and sacred. Um, and it's, it, is, it, is, uh, it is really important to understand the things that other people consider pure and sacred. And, and to treat them with, treat those items with great respect. Um, Jonathan Hyde points out a few times, when you violate somebody's sense of purity or sacredness, you, you trigger disgust um, in them. You trigger a very strong emotional reaction that is hard to get over once you've triggered it. It's kind of like um, if you get in an argument with somebody, it may, you may have to sit down and cool down for a little bit before you go back and re-engage the subject. Um, we have ways of triggering strong emotional responses in people, and sometimes we very, do it very intentionally. And I, I really like these two examples because they, they illustrate it well. Some people in America consider the flag sacred. Um, it is a, it, some people have a very strong opinion that it's sacred. And um, so if you want to speak in a way that those people will hear you, on the left, if you put your flag on a pole and um, hold it high and proudly in front of a march, um, you can speak to those people. If you use the flag as, as part of a, a, even a, a very clever little costume on the left, on the right, about America holding the world and about, ready, you know, we could blow it up with our policies, um, you're playing with something that people other than you consider sacred, that, you know, that, that people, that, that the minute you start using items that some people consider sacred to make your own points, um, you have to be cautious, conscious of the, the emotional responses you may be triggering. Um, some ideas as we're talking about the Energy Innovation and, and uh, Carbon Dividend Act is, is, again, finding ways to bring groups or bring messengers in from sacred spaces into the conversation. 
Um, on the right, the Evangelical Environmental Network is a great place to look for ideas on that. Young Evan and Young Evangelicals for Climate Action is another good place. Um, I would not necessarily classify either of those groups as conservatives, uh, but they have a message that can resonate with conservatives. Um, Catherine Hayhoe also has some very solid posts on these ideas about uh, 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 being a Christian and, and supporting climate science. Um, and, and many, I've seen her talk a few times where she has taken time to really speak to that. Um, also, if you fair, share a faith tradition with the conservatives you're speaking to, um, you know, you, you be open about it and, and, and use that. Um, and, and then by the, just the, uh, the most important point really is showing respect for the other person by treating things they consider sacred uh, with the respect that you'd hope other people would treat things you consider sacred. All right, so that's kind of a quick wrap up of Jonathan Haidt's work. And, um, you know, I, I, could, I could talk on that a, a lot more, um, uh, but th th I really wanted to get a transition into the, uh, into the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividends Act. And um, so let's move on to the next slide. And we're going to talk through the uh, next slide too. Uh, the five key messaging points um, that we present um, that are that are right there on the on the home page for the Ener energy innovation act.org the website we've put up for this and we're just going to walk through each of these from left to right um, over the next over the course of the next few slides um, so our first main talking point this is this is the, the I'm going to go through the exact wordings that we are, we're working with in CCL that we're training all volunteers on is that our, our policy is effective our policy will reduce emissions by at least 40 percent within 12 years and it's supported by economists scientists to simple comprehensive and effective and this is a really important message for conservatives uh, uh, each of these will have a little format where, where we'll, I'll go through the main messaging and then we'll, we'll talk about, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the secondary messaging. There are a lot of conservatives out there a, uh, that will argue, especially ones that are pushing back, that these policies really don't accomplish anything. Um, they will take uh, <clears throat> any kind of a, uh, they will sum up global emissions and look at whether this is actually going to impact global emissions. And they will argue that uh, policies are not effective. And we really need to push back on that with clear um, language and conviction that our policy is effective. It will reduce our emissions by 40% within 12 years and, and continue to push our emissions down to 90% below our 2015 levels and allow us to be a leader in the world um, negotiating with other countries as we work together internationally to drive down global emissions. Um, we need to be a leader in this space, um, and uh, this policy will be effective at allowing us to do that. The, po the policy also, the legislation has provisions to encourage negotiations with other countries and also to, to deal with other countries that don't take appropriate measure through our border tax adjustments. Um, so, so um, just a always always pivot to that our policy is effective and like I would just never give up if, if on the concept that our policy is effective if somebody's arguing the other side of that. So our second talking point is that our policy is good for people. The policy will improve health and save lives by reducing pollution that Americans breathe and the carbon dividends put money into people's pockets every month to spend as they see fit helping low and middle income Americans. But let's move on to the talking points. This is this is also very consistent with re, with Republican and conservative messaging um, across the board. Uh, the 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 focusing on people's health and on clean air and clean water is a very conservative principle that a lot of conservatives groups do without talking about climate. Even um, when you're messaging to conservatives, I'd also just have it in your hip pocket. Have it something that you can say quickly that this is a Republican tradition. The Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act were both signed by Re Republican President Nixon and the uh, Montreal Protocol was negotiated by uh, President Reagan um, and those were all designed to help people's health um, and that, that there is no there is no uh, deviation from caring about people's health and, and legislating and negotiating international treaties that protect people's health 
Uh, there's no division between that and Republican values. The dividend, I also think is important just to talk about the, the uh, so our key message is that the, the dividend puts money back in people's pockets and this is good for, uh, for Americans, especially those at the bottom of the in, end of the income scale. A, a pushback that you uh, may expect in speaking to conservatives if, if you've spoken to enough is that this is just wealth redistribution. You're just talking about wealth redistribution, I get it. And um, I like to really stress that the dividend the, the, the dividend is equally given to people and people choose how much they're going to emit through the decisions that they make in their life. And the government is not going to come in and tell Jim Tolbert, um, you know, that I have to spend my dividend on LED light bulbs until I've replaced every last fluorescent light bulb in my house. Um, the government is going to give me the money and I'm going to make choices on it. And people that make choices uh, that have more CO2 footprint um, are not going to get back as much money as they spend, and it's strictly on their choices. The reality of that is that people in lower incomes brackets typically have less emissions. They have a lower carbon footprint. So people in the lower income brackets are going to get back more money strictly because of the choices that people in the different income brackets make with the money they have available to them. Um, and, I, and I use that, I'll, I'll even start from this point of it's a choice decision and a second, a consequence of that is that people in the lower brackets that have lower carbon footprints will do better under this program. We'll get back more money, um, and and that's a good way to to um, counter this idea that this is a wealth redistribution program that can get pushed back from the right. So our third talking point is that the Energy Innovation and Carbon Carbon Dividends Act creates job. The policy is going to create 2.1 million additional jobs over the next 10 years in the clean energy economy. And, and the next slide, I like, I really don't have much to add to that. That I love that messaging. Um, the only piece I would caution people on is never confuse the clean energy economy that we use almost as if it's hyphenated in that with jobs in clean energy. Um, and even if somebody looks confused, you may need to straighten that out for them uh, when you're talking to a conservative. These jobs that are being added are not in clean energy per se. Um, we will lose jobs in the oil industry or in coal mining and gain jobs, solar installing and putting up windmills. And you know, companies like GE might sell more wind turbines than they sell turbines for natural gas fired power plants. Um, but the real gains in jobs, according to our own Remy study, is in healthcare and in consumer spend, places where people can spend their money in a, from a consumer spending perspective. Um, so we call it a clean energy economy, but we're not, we're not trying to imply that there are 2.1 million new jobs in uh, putting up wind farms uh, where, while the rest of the economy stays the same. And our fourth message is that it's bipartisan. Um, Republicans and Democrats are both on board co-sponsoring the legislation. The majority of Americans support Congress taking action on climate change and solving this change is too urgent to get caught up in partisan politics. And uh, then moving on to the next slide. So, so uh, most of that stands alone by itself, depending on how partisan of a crowd you are in. Um, I, have, I have often had discussions with Republicans that it is important for Republicans to engage on this issue. Uh, some people phrase it, not cede the issue to Democrats. I, I guess now that I've looked at my own slide that I wrote myself, I don't usually use those words. I usually fall back on polling of uh, millennial Republicans uh, that, that to hold the Republican Party together, the Republicans need to have a position that's real on climate change. It's going to have impact. Um, I also will talk about Republicans uh, even to, to pick up the, the center votes after the partisan primaries to win statewide elections. Um, Republicans need to have uh, policies that are conservative that will um, address climate change. It is a, a growing important issue uh, in the American electorate and, and, uh, and, and it's critical for Republicans to have that it's, and that also it is, it is beneficial to be seen as working uh, with across the, across the table with the other party in today's uh, demographics. And the final message, it's revenue neutral. Um, the fees collected on carbon emissions will be allocated to Americans to spend how they choose. The government will not keep any of the fees collected, so the size of the government will not grow. Um, this one, like, almost couldn't have been written better if we're talking about conservative messaging. 
Um, next slide. So, so this, this really is a, a critical point that plays well with conservatives. Um, so th these are kind of sub-tier. Um, one issue that I get is that that will never last. The government's going to get their hands on this money one way or the other. Um, and, um, you know, a, a, a distrust that the government's actually going to distribute the money. And the fee, this, this, uh, the dividend really is um, the key to making it so that the government does distribute the money. Once people start getting the dividend, um, it will be harder and harder for the government to, to play games with it and start spending it on other things and say, well, yeah, but we really want to spend this on uh, roads and bridges and job retraining. And, you know, the government knows which technology should really be applied. So what we really want to do is start giving some tax credits and for certain technologies that play well in my district, because I'm a member of Congress, the, 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 the giving the money back is what's going to keep the governments from spending that money. Another, alloc another uh, variant that you will see sometimes is that as are people uh, suggesting that we use the fee to offset other taxes. Um, and this, this uh, it has, has some strong proponents on the right. And, and uh, one uh, discussion topic you can get into if, you, if you're in a conversation with somebody like that is that um, giving the feedback is a much more transparent way to make sure that all of that this truly stays revenue neutral. The minute the fee just gets blended into the IRS's general revenues and we offset some other taxes, um, those, there, is, there is no way to keep that transparent to say this has actually stayed revenue neutral. And, and finally, just a point to make sure that you, are, you, you are, don't get caught off guard. Um, there are administrative costs to this program, and it is written into the legislation that those administrative costs are going to get covered by the fee. Um, and there's just no other way to do it. There is some cost to really keep it revenue neutral where we're not impacting the tax the, the taxpayers of the United States in any other way. We're using a, a small portion of this fee to administer getting the money back to people. After the first five years, that fee under the legislation can be no higher than 2% of those fees collected. Um, so there are provisions in there that recognize there's an administrative fee and there's specific language in there saying it can be no higher than 2% of the total fees after the first five years. Um, that's just an important, it's important to be able to say that quickly or, or maybe not quickly, but uh, not stumble on that if somebody pushes back on that. All right, so um, the, the, just in concluding, I do wanna conclude that section by saying um, those five key messages, uh, the, the, the team in CCL that put those together um, really focused on making sure they, they played, they, they were heard well by conservatives as well as progressives. Um, so those, those messages are, are written in, in a way that um, does, I think does play very well with conservative audiences. So let's look at some uh, of what, what, how people have been responding to this. Um, next slide, there are a number of groups that work in this space. Um, oh, here's just some excerpts from, um, if you want some quotes, uh, uh, Congressman Rooney and Fitzpatrick in, in the press release both made some statements that you can use as direct quotes from, from uh, Republican members of Congress. If you're really looking for some uh, conservative uh, credentials, uh, Representative uh, Congressman Rooney has is a much stronger uh, viewed as a much more traditional conservative Republican, uh, and 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 uh, Congress, Congressman Fitzpatrick is viewed as a more moderate uh, Republican. So if you're really wanting to get to get a good conservative link in there, I'm using the quote from uh, uh, Francis Rooney, uh, maybe a better bet. Um, Alliance for Market Solutions and the Scannon Center have also come out with some positive statements on this, as well as um, uh, Republic EN has put out, uh, has, has messaged it well for us, and um, uh, the Climate Leadership Council, I think, also came out with a nice public statement. So some of the groups on the right that are supporting similar policies or similar ideas um, have come out with some, on, when the bill was introduced, came out with some nice uh, statements uh, that they, that they uh, we're presenting to the press to, to encourage some spin and buzz and media coverage around this. So that said, the other groups are not endorsing our policy. So these are not endorsements. 
Um, groups like Republic EN do cannot endorse legislation. They are, they are a C3. They will never endorse legislation, but they will message on uh, legislation. Um, the Climate Leadership Council obviously has a little bit different plan than they're pitching, um, as does Alliance for Market Solutions. Um, there was there is a nice bill out there that I think I put in the footnotes for this um, by Noah Kaufman uh, at Columbia comparing a few different approaches for a carbon tax that, and in that he includes um, three different Republican options or, or, or two Republicans and one bipartisan option. I said that wrong. So the Deutsch bill on this graph here, uh, the graph is just a, a summary from the article that Noah Kaufman wrote at Columbia. And um, the purple line shows the uh, CCL policy with the rate of increase. Uh, and the other two lines, he, he reviews then Carbello's bill that he had in the, in the 115th Congress that will be going away at the end of the year here. And he also included the Baker line there, the dashed gray line is for the Climate Leadership Council position. Uh, the Baker Schultz plan, however, however they want to call it, as well as Senator Whitehouse's bill on, on the Democratic side. Um, with really the uh, conclusion that our bill is is more aggressive than than White House's bill or than than either of the other two bills over the long run. Yeah. So the another difference in carbon pricing approaches is that some of these other groups want to use the that fee that they're going to have for different purposes. There are a number of subtle variations we've covered in other places. There are also a whole series of groups on the right that um, are not talking about carbon pricing, but that are talking about clean energy and that are trying to get to a clean, trying to get to uh, clean energy implementation um, with different suites of policy. And I'm gonna lump them into two categories here that, that, uh, that I think people should be aware of. There's a, the Clean Capitalist Coalition. You can look them up. They're just cleancapitalistcoalition.org. Um, has a is a coalition that um, supports a bunch of alternate of different policies. The they they support clean asset bonds. They support tax credits for innovative energy solutions. They support some voluntary greenhouse gas emissions reporting that allows people to take some uh, offset credits under 45Q uh, tax policy that was uh, implemented earlier. Um, and, and then also uh, kind of tax uh, forgiveness for zero emission sources of energy um, and uh, cutting subsidies for uh, emissions intensive energy sources. Um, to me, all these are kind of picking winners and losers and the, they distort markets in different ways. They don't have, if, if we say there's a $40 a ton of CO2 emission price on carbon, it impacts everybody proportional to how much CO2 they're putting off. Each of these are gonna impact each of these areas differently. Um, so it, it, it will distort markets unevenly. Uh, but there is a pretty strong coalition around this. If you look up Clean Capitalist Coalition and go to their about page, you can see who's in this group. It includes ClearPath. Um, for those of you familiar, uh, Jay Faison's work out, in, out of North Carolina. It includes EarthX down in Texas and Trammell Crow. Um, it includes Conserve America and Rob Sisson's work. Um, it includes a suite of, of organizations um, that we work with and maintain dialogues with and have uh, good relationships with. And we wanna keep those friendly relationships with them while recognizing that their policy is a little different than our. Ours, many of, their, many of their goals are very similar to ours. And just like building coalitions on the left, we're building coalition, trying to build coalitions on the right and always working to communicate with these organizations respectfully, um, to have the dialogue, to, to uh, when it's appropriate, express why we think our policy is actually, in my view, more market friendly, less market distorting, and more conservative than their approaches are, um, though they would, they then, um, have their own opinion on that conversation. Um, there's also a group called the Conservative Energy Network, uh, which you can also find very easily that has state affiliates across the country that um, are really focusing on open markets for electric electricity at a state level. They don't get involved in federal legislation. Um, and many of you who may have bumped into some of their state affiliates, uh, like the Wisconsin, Michigan Conservative Energy Forum, um, or the uh, Conservatives for Clean Energy. 
uh, down here in North Carolina and Virginia. Um, so in, in all of those groups, just leaving as we walk away from that slide is fine. Uh, the a message I really want to leave people with is when you have conversations with those, treat those people with great respect. If you're in one of their meetings, uh, cooperate with the intent of their meeting and don't feel like you need to turn everything into a carbon pricing discussion. Um, but if you can interact with them, they are great places to build relationships with people that uh, may agree with you on a lot of issues um, and, and are, are conservative. Um, so we also kind of, so we've been stepping to groups that, that view our, that are less close to our policy. We're gonna, gonna take a, a large step now and, and talk about the, the fact that there are groups out there that are opposing our policy. Um, so the next slide, um, you know, mo many of you are familiar with, with groups such as Heartland Institute or the CO2 Coalition. Um, some of the two examples of some, uh, opposition, I think is the right word, that, that are out there right now. We've put uh, some links for here, um, hot linked is if you if you download this, this later. Uh, one is Americans for Tax Reform is has put out a, uh, a, uh, a wonderfully named article on the details of the horrible carbon tax bill, um, because it just sounds like a children's story. Um, I, <laughs> I laugh every time I read it, which is good because if I don't laugh, I often have a, a feeling of disgust that is hard to get over and I have to go sit down for a few minutes. Um, and the Competitive Enterprise Institute and, Ameri and uh, Centers for Enterprise, Competitive Enterprise Institute and American, yeah, American Enterprise Institute, also uh, just before our bill came out, held a forum um, that they recorded. Uh, that, that was really set up by AEI, that was set up and designed to look like a panel of two people on each side talking, uh, but was also kind of set up in a lopsided fashion by AEI um, uh, to, to present the case that there isn't a case, conservative case for carbon tax is, is my view of why they put it on. And there's a link there that, that you can go, uh, go watch if you really want to. I would, um, just really stress that uh, if you're going to go pay attention to the opposition, uh, make sure that you, you know you have somebody at the back end. You can go get a a, 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 a dose of uh, encouragement from at the back end of it. Don't let the opposition derail you from being motivated to do action. It's very easy to read these and to just start feeling a sense of, oh, I need to push back on these organizations. And the minute they get you focusing on their messaging or posting a, a reply to their Facebook pay, post, as opposed to going and doing what's more important, writing a letter to your member of Congress, getting an LTE published, um, they've won. Um, they've distracted you from doing what it is that we do so well. We have a, a great ground game, and uh, it's important to understand the messages that are coming out from the opposition, but it's more important to not let um, that messaging distract us from the tactics that we've developed and work on. What I'd really like to get people to, to, to view is a way to look at these and how to go back to our five key points. If you find yourself in a conversation that sounds something like this, or, or maybe I should say, when you find yourself in a conversation that, that sounds something like this. This bill imposes a massive and continually ratcheting natural, national energy tax, allowing politicians to raise taxes without ever having to vote, just like the French proposal that starts with a big tax that gets more oppressive with time. This bill imposes a $15 per ton carbon energy tax, increasing by $10 each year into the future. Within five years, the tax would automatically rise to $55 per ton. For reference, the carbon tax handily rejected by blue Washington state voters in November started at $15 and ratcheted only up $2 per year. Perhaps Deutsch thinks the voters just want to be taxed at even higher rates. So a response to that might sound something like this. You know what, I, th I think that, that uh, Deutsch along with Fitzpatrick and, uh, and uh, the other Republican co-sponsors were what they really wanted was an effective policy that could actually drive down our carbon emissions and and particularly one that was going to be good for the people in their district and then bring in the background between of a for effective policy and good for the people in your district as as much as as much as you want to
Excellent. Well, my response is this, Jim. I think this bill shovels taxpayer money into a giant vat for the IRS, the EPA, and the State Department bureaucrats. The IRS and the EPA will develop a cozy little relationship. And what's not to love about that? To siphon cash from the vat of taxpayer funds for what the bill calls administrative expenses and other administrative expenses. For reasons unclear, the State Department bureaucrats will also have access to that vat of taxpayer funds. What could go wrong? Yeah, I think this is a really legitimate concern. That's why the bill stresses that the, that the fee is going to be revenue neutral so that the revenues are not kept by the government. There are some administrative costs that instead of putting those onto the taxpayers to pay for it, there is a small administrative cost that will be taken out of the fee that after the first five years will be no higher than 2% of all the fees collected. Um, so there are administrative costs in implementing a program like this. There are ways to keep them very low, down below 2%, and it's important for us to make sure that this stays revenue neutral. Well, great. This bill gives czar-like powers to the EPA chief, including the power to impose monitoring, reporting, and record-keeping requirements on Americans. The bill also gives the EPA chief power to conduct investigations and force information collection. Absolutely. The bill is, effect, will, is going to be effective at driving down emissions. To, to make sure that we know that we're being effective at driving down emissions, there are some monitoring, reporting, and record keeping requirements that we need to make sure are happening. Uh, the last thing we would want to do is, is uh, implement a bill like this and not have a way to evaluate its effectiveness. So those are really just examples on, on if somebody presents an argument to you, pivoting back to what, finding a way, if you can, while you're, while you're thinking of your response, finding a way to pivot back to, it's an effective policy, it's good for people, it's good for the economy, it's bipartisan or it's revenue neutral, and bringing conversations back to those points, even if you might wanna go slug, a, slug it out on some detail that they put in there that, that uh, you know, triggered you emotionally. Um, don't let them control how, where you're gonna respond from. I thank Jim enough for his time tonight. It was deeply beneficial. Here's a link again to where to find out more information about the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act and the wonderful policy details. Here's my email as well. And we'd love to be in touch. The biggest thing that we want to close on this wonderful and historic night, though, is just thanking all of you for making time to join us to help us move forward with these critical conversations in communities and with individuals, families, and friends, especially the Julian right, that can have more empowered conversations now to identify those shared values and move them closer to support. We hope you found this webinar useful and we wish you a wonderful rest of your week. We'll see you all soon, everyone. Night.